She is the lead and co-investigator of several research grants and has published over 70 peer-reviewed papers and was featured on CNN African Voices for her work in sickle cell pregnancy and maternal health. Professor Bosede is the current head of departments of obstetrics and gynecology at the College of Medicine, University of Lagos. She is a fellow of the Royal College of Obstetrics and Gynecologists, UK, and of Nigerian Postgraduate Colleges. She, is also, she also has a certificate in epidemiology and biostatistics from Harvard School of Medicine, Harvard School of Public Health. Oh. And you know what the man is doing, but is he the only one in you? So can you please mute if you're not speaking? Thank you. you know that she has more than 20 young obstetricians and gynecologists, many of them on the call today, and is a mentor to many other medical and non-medical colleagues. She's a woman's advocate and is passionate about reducing maternal mortality. It is my great pleasure to welcome warmly Professor Bosedi Afolabi to give us, um, you know, to, to learn from her wealth of experience as she proceeds with her teaching for today. We're going to stop sharing our slides now so that Dr. Bosede can um, share her screen. Over to you, Dr. Over to you, Prof. <laughs> I was talking to myself. I do apologize. <laughs> I was muted as you sometimes do when you get on the Zoom. Anyway, yeah. um, I was saying that thank you very much for that introduction. I know I did give you the bio, but it's nice to hear it coming from you. <laughs> um, good afternoon, all. My name is Bosa Diafalabi, as introduced by Dr. Kendra. And today I'm speaking about one of the topics I like to speak about the most, and that is um, pregnancy and sickle cell disease. I also um, look after these, these women as well as do a lot of research on them. So they're dear to my heart and um, I'll be taking the next 30 minutes to speak about um, their care. So I'll go through this background, so very brief um, pathophysiology and genetic origin, um, concentrate more on the clinical features and the current evidence on pregnancy related complications, talk about management and postpartum care, as well as some updates, and then just give you very quickly um, the current research that we're doing in sickle cell pregnancy. Um, so sickle cell disease or disorder, um, now, a lot of hematologists are saying don't call it disease, call it disorder, because disease um, connotes um, negative, um, uh, has ne negative connotations. It's um, a hemoglobinopathy, that is a, a disorder of hemoglobin, which occurs from a mutation um, in the sixth codon of the gene encoding beta globulin. We know that it's a homozygous disease, um, I'm sorry, this one that we call sickle cell anemia is a homozygous disease. The others are called sickle cell disease. So if we say sickle cell anemia, we're re referring specifically to HBSS. But if we say sickle cell disease, then we're speaking about all the other um, ones, including HBSS. So we, we're talking about sickle cell beta thalassemia, S, D, S, E, S, C, or S, O, R, R. However, if we say C, C, or D, D, those are not sickle cell um, conditions because S is not included. It's important to take note of that, especially when you're doing research or you're trying to name um, things. So sickle cell disorder is um, inherited in an autosomal recessive pattern. And the important thing about that is that if you have an AS um, individual getting together with um, an, another AS individual, the likelihood of them having an SS child is one in four um, one in four. So it doesn't mean if they have four children, only one of them will have become SS. It means that each time they have a pregnancy is a throw of the dice and 20, they have a 25% chance of having an SS baby. 
It's even worse if the woman is SS and the husband is AS, because then they have a 50% chance of having um, an SS uh, baby each time. So that's the nomenclature. And remember that um, we also do not call them sicklers. Please change that term if you, if you tend to use it. It's not a nice term. Say HBSS or sickle cell disorder or hemoglobin SS, but not sickler. They're not sicklers, they're actually warriors. Now, speaking on the pathophysiology, um, we've often spoke, said that um, what happens is that the hemoglobin, the red cell becomes deformed because of that mutation, the red cell becomes deformed in shape. But what actually happens, why it becomes deform, deformed in shape is because it forms polymers. So that the, the main pathophysiology is actually of polymerization, that is um, consolidation of different materials within of the, the different hemoglobins, making the sickle cell have a deformed shape. When it's deformed like that, it becomes fragile. And so trying to pass through the vessels, it's broken down, that is the hemolysis, and then it also blocks the vessels. So these um, red cells break down because they're fragile, and then they also clog the vessels. And when they clog the vessels, they become slow and are prone to thrombosis. And also the, um, the blood supply to the organs they supply becomes um, reduced. And that's where you have your ischemia and the bone plane crisis, as well as sometimes when it's really badly reduced, you get infarction. And that's when they have the hip necrosis and those diseases they have. Also in the lungs, that's when they get the acute chest syndrome or the tendency to pneumonias. The trigger factor, factors for these um, uh, crises include infections, hypoxia, that is situations of low oxygen concentration, dehydration, that is when they are not drinking much, temperature changes, either ex um, extreme heat or extreme cold, and pregnancy itself is a trigger factor for um, uh, crises. And another thing we need to take note of is that in, in areas when dehydration also is a problem in pregnancy. So overhydration is, will not cause crisis. It's not good for them to overhydrate as in when they do it excessively, but it doesn't cause crisis. So I was just trying to pull attention to the fact that dehydration is the more important thing in um, sickle cell um, pregnancy or just sickle cell um, disease generally. Now, moving straight to the pregnancy um, issue. Uh, pregnancy, Nigeria has the highest number of women or people generally living with sickle cell disorder in the world. Two to three percent of the population have sickle cell disease. In the past, it was seen as a disease of childhood because few of them survived past the age of five. But now there's been improved survival over the years, and many are now surviving to pregnancy. Now, for the mother in pregnancy, clinical features include more frequent crises. They generally have vasoclusive crises more in pregnancy. Um, so take note of that. Urinary and respiratory infections are also more in pregnancy. In fact, one of the things we see the most amongst them is them coming in with a cough. And during this COVID time, many people are very worried when anybody comes in with a cough, as you know. But they do come in with coughs um, and urinary infections. So it's important to screen for that when they're pregnant and look out for that. Acute chest syndrome is another thing that happens in pregnancy. Malaria as well. Um, hemolytic crises are also fairly common. Um, relatively common, although not, not more common than the vasoclusive. Vasoclusive prices are still the most um, common complications in pregnancy. Preeclampsia also occurs in women with sickle cell disorder, and they do get admitted more and do get operative deliveries more, including cesarean sections. Not because that's how we should deliver them, but because unfortunately um, they tend to um, need it for different obstetric or um, pelvic issues. Thromboembolic events also occur because they are prone to thromboembolism generally from their constitution, as well as the fact that pregnancy is also a hyperthrombotic state. So for that reason, they, they do have that and we need to be careful about those issues. I've put miscarriage and pseudotoxemia in query query 
because we're not 100% sure of the miscarriage yet. However, a study done by Graham et al. in Jamaica, where they followed up these women from when they were children till when they got pregnant and you know, till after delivery, they found that a number of them had more episodes of miscarriage than their hemoglobin AA counterparts. So that's, that's one study has shown that. Unfortunately, a lot of studies are not being done in these women, and that's what we're trying to um, change in, in my team. Um, so we've also found in, we're doing a study at the moment as well that we, we seem to be seeing a bit more miscarriage, but we can't say for sure until we've completed it. Pseudotoxemia is another thing that was said to occur in them quite a lot. Pseudotoxemia refers to the fact that preeclampsia used to be known as toxemia. So sickle cell disease, the condition that happens in them where they have a raised systolic hypertension, just the systolic alone, as well as proteinuria, tends to, is seen to, was now named um, pseudotoxemia. However, we're not really sure if this occurs a lot. We did a study in my um, team that we found maybe three out of 50 women with sickle cell disorder having pseudotoxemia. But we're in, a, in the larger study we're working on now, where we're hoping to recruit up to 476 women with sickle cell anemia or sickle cell disease disorder, we will see if pseudotoxemia is definitely more um, prevalent as we, as we suspect. For the fetus, it's three main things. Prematurity, they do tend to deliver earlier than their hemoglobin AA counterparts. Intrauterine growth restriction is another thing. And then they have increased perinatal mortality, which includes increased stillbirths and increased early neonatal deaths. This definitely occurs in them. And even with the amount of um, work we've done and attention to detail, we still get more perinatal mortality in them than in the hemoglobin AA counterparts. We start, my team and I um, carried out this study on um, sickle cell pregnant women recently, we reported on 50 consecutive booked hemoglobin SS pregnant women matched by age, parity, and gestational age at booking um, for with HBA women, and we found that um, pregnancy-induced hypertension were more was more common in them. Intrauterine growth restriction, urinary tract infection, and preterm deliveries were significantly more common. One important thing that we did not find. In our, team, in our uh, study, we found we did not have one, one maternal death in 50 consecutive women, which is very unusual because we, are, we know that they have um, an increased um, incidence of maternal mortality. However, what we've shown and has been shown in some studies also done in the richer countries is that with detailed, attentive care, you can actually reduce that maternal mortality rate in them. And in some series too, um, in the, from published in the UK and in the US, they also found you know, the deaths. So it's possible to actually look after these women without losing them. And so it's, uh, I would like to try and um, speak to how that uh, can be done. First of all, ideally, we should try to manage them from preconception. I, mean, I know that's not always possible, but if, if we can catch women before they get pregnant, that's, that would be the best. And um, what we do when they come in is to check their blood pressures, check their urine, do a renal function test for them. We want to try and find out if they have proteinuria, that is um, sickle cell, which can indicate sickle cell nephropathy. And for those women, we really need to um, treat them, send them to the uh, physicians, the renal uh, physicians, so that they can help treat and prevent the progression to end-stage renal disease. Um, because proteinuria tends to worsen in pregnancy. So it's important to catch them before pregnancy, these women with sickle cell nephropathy. Another thing that we should ideally screen for, which we don't tend to do, is pulmonary hypertension. We should screen for pulmonary hypertension by, um, by um, doing echocardiography. The, the cardiologist will help with that. We don't do it often, um, but because we know that pulmonary hypertension itself is a very, very poor risk factor for um, poor prognosis for uh, delivery for pregnancy, 
if a woman already has pulmonary hypertension and a woman with sickle cell disease, she can be counseled appropriately and maybe even deterred from getting pregnant herself because pulmonary hypertension is one of those conditions where if it's quite, if it's moderate, it can lead to maternal mortality just by itself. Um, full blood counts, knowing their blood pressures, knowing their, uh, that their current hemoglobin is at steady state is important. If uh, their full blood count shows that their hemoglobin concentration is low, then you want to build them up before they get pregnant. Um, and also, if after a recent crisis or transfusion, you want to also tell them to hold on before they get pregnant, which is, so these are the reasons why it's important to do some degree of um, uh, preconceptual counseling with them. Hydroxyurea is another thing, if they're on it, it's good to stop it for at least three months before conception. However, if they're already using it and they get pregnant while they're on hydroxyurea, we can reassure them that they don't need to terminate the pregnancy because a lot of studies, case series, case reports have shown that a lot of women on um, hydroxyurea in early pregnancy or even before they got pregnant have not had any obvious issues of um, uh, teratogenicity. At, that is abnormal babies, but it's still good to ask them to discontinue it because hydroxyurea is a class D drug, it's contraindicated in pregnancy. It's important also to screen their partners because as you can imagine, if their partner is not AA, if their partner happens to have a sickle cell trait, then the risk factor, the risk of having um, a fetus with um, a baby with sickle cell disorder is 50% for each pregnancy. So partner screening is, is important in preconceptual counseling. And then information about pregnancy and its risks to tell them to avoid dehydration, temperature extremes, and stress, um, and to also book early while, when they are pregnant. Managing them is ideally, that is when they get pregnant, is ideally a multidisciplinary issue. And at this stage, I want to emphasize that if there are any nurses or people working in primary health care centers in this audience, it's important to note that you cannot manage um, a patient with sickle cell disease on your own, when, especially when they're pregnant. Um, and in primary health centers too, it's important to refer them, not because you don't have um, uh, the knowledge or the aptitude to uh, manage these women, but because there's so many things that can go wrong very quickly in their, in their health. And so it's better for them to manage in at least a secondary care setting and if possible, tertiary care setting. Um, during, when they're with the book in the first instance, we usually take a history, a good history from them, pattern of previous crises, if they've had a lot, number of crises before. And even if there are people who have never had, I've had several patients who have been fine. They've, in fact, they've never been transfused. It's during pregnancy that they have their first transfusion because pregnancy can be very, very demanding on them. So the pattern of their pre previous crises, if they've had a lot of um, hemolytic uh, crises in the past, they tend to have a bit more, um, at a bit higher risk. If um, they've had vesoclusive crisis, crisis is neither here nor there. They could have more, they could have the same, they could have fewer. For um, investigations, we need to have, do a full blood count. They are the ideal. We shouldn't just be doing packed cell volume alone uh, as we do in some public hospitals for women with sickle cell disease. We should do the full blood count, look at the full parameters uh, because we want to also look at their white cell counts. We want to look at the differentials of the white cell counts. We want to look at the platelets. We want to look at the mean corpuscular volumes and the MCHs. And the reason we want to do these is because they give us an idea of how to manage them better. So for example, if the mean corpuscular volumes and MCV happen to be low, then it's possible that these particular patients may actually have iron deficiency and you should go on and check their iron. You know, normally we don't give um, sickle cell disease um, patients iron. And that's because they are often hemolyzing, that is they're breaking down their red cells and that those red cells stay within them. They don't lose them like people that have um, periods. They, they, they keep the red cells and that is full of iron. So they tend to have more iron on board. They've also been transfused and in the past. So they tend to have more iron on board. Um, and so we don't tend to give them iron and they don't tend to need iron. 
But sometimes a few of them, especially those that have been very well before pregnancy, not having a lot of crises, not having been transfused often, they may need iron and their full blood count may, may give you an idea about this in the first instance. Another thing is the uh, white cell count, even though white cell count tends to be high in sickle cell patients, especially pregnant in pregnancy. So you can have a woman with sickle cell disease who's pregnant, who's in her first trimester or her early second trimester, and her white cell count is 14,000 and it's absolutely normal, it's possible. But you do have to be careful to look at the differentials. If the differentials are showing you a neutrophilia, then it's likely that something else is going on, which is that is possibly a bacterial infection is going on. Or if it's showing an obvious lymphocytosis as well, it's possible that they have a viral infection. So be careful with that. Know that white cell count tends to be raised in them, but that um, uh, it, it's usually, uh, if they have an infection, it's also possible that it, it, it's indicating that. The usual viral markers, the syphilis tests, they should also be done when in antenatally. And ideally, you should also do at least one electrolytes, urea and creatinine and liver function test when they book so that you can have an idea of how their kidney is functioning because a lot of them won't have come for that preconceptual um, test or preconceptual visit. So you might have to do those, um, the um, electrolytes, urea and creatinine and liver function test when they come for the antenatal visits. Folic acid and proguanil, I've already spoken about why they don't need iron, but why they need folic acid is because they're constantly hemolyzing, so they need to have their uh, red cells rebuilt. And the only thing that helps um, redevelop or regrow red cells or any cells in the body generally is folic acid. Because they have so much hemolysis, they need quite a, a lot of folic acid. So normally, even though what most pregnant women need folic acid-wise is just about 400 micrograms per day, we will we we recommend that women with sickle cell disease have five milligrams daily of folic acid and the proguanil. It doesn't have to be proguanil itself, although that's what we've always given because we know that it seems we have this idea that it's more effective than um, sulfidoxine pyrimethamine. But if the woman can't afford proguanil, we may have no choice but to give her monthly sulfidoxine pyrimethamine. But we advocate proguanil because we believe it's more effective um, than of adoxin pyrimethamine in preventing malaria, which they are prone to. Now, at each visit, um, we also ask them, so a woman comes in for my antenatal clinic, and I usually ask her, after, uh, have you been ill? Uh, do you have any um, symptoms at all? Are you feeling unwell, or have you felt unwell in the last few um, it's important to ask them and it's important to also tell them that if they feel unwell at all, they shouldn't wait at home as they normally did when they were pregnant or they, should, they shouldn't just use um, analgesia by themselves. They should try to make sure that they go straight to a uh, hospital um, to be seen. It's better for us to see you and say go back home than to just keep at home and let things change with you. One other important thing that should be done during their antenatal visits is to check their vital signs. We don't tend to check all the vital signs for our regular pregnant women. All we do is check their weight, their urinalysis, their blood pressure. Um, yeah, that, those are the main things we tend to do um, for routinely for pregnant women. But in, for sickle cell women, for women with sickle cell disease, we should check all the vital signs, at least their pulse rate, their blood pressure, as well as their oxygen saturation. That's SpO2. If we're going to do anything new at all, if you're going to learn anything new in terms of looking after women with sickle cell disease, it is to pay attention to the detail of their vital signs. It's so key. Because when you do that, then you can pick things that go wrong with them quickly. People say that, oh, they just, you know, things go like this with them. Yes, things go very quickly with them because we're not paying attention to those details. If you pay attention to those details, you can pick it within minutes. I tend to tell uh, my doctors that I don't want you to wait until, you know how we can be in public hospital sometimes. You go and see the patients, you record the vital signs, you go away, you ask for the relative to do tests, you come back tomorrow to go and see if they've done the test. No, you can't afford to do that with women with sickle cell disease. You have to be on the ball per hour because if you are not, you can lose them. But if you are, you can preempt 
things before they become you know, serious. So if the pulse rate of a woman with sickle cell disease, if you have a chart for them in their case notes, and this visit they come, it's been 80 or it's been 86, and then all of a sudden you are seeing 120 or you're seeing 110, alarm bells should ring. Something is going on here. If they're on admission and you're looking at their vital signs every hour or every two hours, as you should when they first come in, you should immediately make sure that you know um, you you pick up on it. Once their vital signs are, you know, pulse rate is going above 100 or 120, and that's not the, or 110, and that's not their usual pulse rate or their oxygen saturation. Sometimes their pulse rates and are actually okay, maybe below 100, and then SpO2 is below 95. You must get onto it. So that's another very important um, thing. They must drink at least three liters of water a day or 0.6 milligrams per kilogram, mm -hmm. meals per kilogram. And um, they should, sorry, they should also um, be advised to keep away from extremes of temperature. Antenatal visits every two weeks till 28 weeks, then weekly visits till delivery ideally, unless more frequent visits are indicated before 28 weeks or if the patient um, can't afford to come that um, regularly, as long as they're doing well, you can still give them maybe two to three weekly visits um, in the first, in early pregnancy. But the ideal is every two weeks to 28 weeks or weekly till delivery. Now, um, ultrasound scans should be done at booking, um, dating the pregnancy. Uh, and at 18 to 22 weeks, you do the anatomy scan um, just as you would for every other woman. They are not known to be at risk for more anomalies than any other patient. That's definitely something that is not um, a complication with them. Um, ideally, they should actually have four weekly scans from 24 weeks to detect IUGR because they are prone to intrauterine growth restriction. However, we know that in our environment, cost can be an issue, and these women do tend to have a lot of cost constraints, especially those of them who come to our public hospitals. The, we can't count the number of times we've had to donate for their cause just to try and make sure that they don't fall into some um, um, illness or the other. But I mean, it's, it's, it's rewarding because you get them well, and that's a very rewarding um, um, thing indeed. So if the scans are unaffordable, we just pay careful attention to their simpsipondal height and then scan when indicated. Admission should be done when a, their PCV drops more than or equal to 3% between consecutive visits or to below 18%. However, I have to um, put caution on that because some women's steady state, I have a patient at the moment, has steady state PCVs between 17 and 18%. So there was a time her HV dropped to about 16%. Um, and, you know, I was like, what's going on here? But everything else was okay with her. So she went on to use um, something she's been using for a while. I'm not going to mention it here because I don't want you to think that that is a treatment per se for sickle cell pregnancy. Okay, I've said it now, so we'll be wondering. Some, some patients, because they can't have frequent transfusions, can only use erythropoietin. But I discussed this with a hematologist recently, and you have to be careful um, in using erythropoietin because it has thrombotic um, risk itself. So you don't just give it really. You have to make sure that you've consulted with a hematologist and you've agreed. Just a free free on any other um, thing to use. Than, than the erythropoietin. So with her, she's always used that in her pregnancies. And once she took her doses, the HB went back to, guess what the HB went back to? 6.7, which is her usual steady state. And I just left her and she's been doing well. If a patient has a febrile illness or a sickle, a vesoclusive crisis, you know, you, would, you may need to admit them if it's not responding to regular um, paracetamol or cocodamol and any other obstetric or medical indication that distorts the vital signs or is not amenable to conservative, conservative management, then they would need to be admitted. When they're admitted, how do you go about it? Aside from what I said already, which is, sorry, it was 60 mil per kilogram, not 0 0.6. You hydrate them with at least three liters of IV fluids daily or 60 mils per kilograms per day. You invite the hematology unit early, especially if there's no obstetric expert. Having said that, and I, um, I start this, I know that not everywhere 
has a hematology unit either or an obstetric expert. If you have a patient that they don't seem to be getting better within a day or two of you know, admitting them, it's better to refer them to a tertiary center early or in a place where you have these um, people working than to keep them and be managing, managing them either in your private setting or in, in, or in a primary healthcare or, or a second, even a secondary healthcare setting. Ideally, you should refer them onwards quickly. If you have them with you, one of the new things, one of the things that you should do different if you haven't been doing them before, like I said before, is are those vital sign monitoring. We, unfortunately, we don't have uh, monitors because ideally if, we, if you're in a place where you have monitors, um, multi-parameter monitors, once you have your sickle cell disease patients on admission, you should immediately put them on a monitor and you know, check so that you can see when their vital signs are going, maybe their pulse rate is going too high or their respiratory rate in particular is going high. Those are some of the things you have to keep an eye on, especially when on admission, respiratory rate is key. SpO2 is key. One of the things that I realized helped us in managing them properly is that, you know, these SpO2 um, uh, pulse oximeters, are now very relatively inexpensive. You can get one, a good one for less than 20,000 Naira. And if you invest in them and you're checking the SPO2, way long before they start deteriorating, you already see that the SPO2 is low. You start them on oxygen, you start um, giving them the appropriate care and they tend to get better quickly. Um, in the case of chest infection though, you should be careful not to overhydrate them. That's really, really key. And I suppose that might be why some people may have answered um, yes to the question on um, hydration. If you overhydrate them, you may tip them into pulmonary edema or um, acute chest syndrome early. So it's important not to overhydrate them, especially if the SpO2 is low and they have chest symptoms like cough. In those cases, the best thing is to try and get them to take oral um, fluids as much as possible. But if they can't take orally, give them their IV fluids. Well, if they don't have chest um, um, symptoms and they don't have um, low XPO2, please make sure you hydrate them properly because that's one of the things that helps with crisis. So it's a balance you have to um, tread. Make sure you don't overhydrate if they have chest um, symptoms as it is, get them to try and drink more. Well, of course, make sure you also continue with at least a maintenance um, IV fluid. But if they don't have chest um, features and they are coming in with your regular vasoclusive prices, it's important to make sure you hydrate them with at least three liters a day or 60 mils per kilograms in 24 hours. Um, transfuse with packed red cells, ideally don't give them whole blood if you can avoid it, and it should be HBAA blood if possible, so that it helps um, reduce the sickle content. And in case of severe anemia, aim to raise the hematocrit to the steady state if you know it, or to between 26 and 28 percent um, PCV. Now, there's some instances where you need um, exchange blood transfusion. One of those um, instances is if a patient has a refractory vessel occlusive crisis. I had one lady who had had five crises before she was 20 weeks pregnant. She just kept have, coming in for admission and they were severe. And this is somebody who never used to have crises when she was not pregnant, maybe in one in two years, but pregnancy really tipped it on. And so at one point we were giving her 10 milligrams of morphine IV four hourly plus no, um, diclofenac injections, uh, 75 milligrams, 12 hourly plus, you know, paracetamol. And she was still crying in pain. And this is somebody who, when she has no pain, she needs nothing. It was not a matter of thinking, oh, maybe this man is addicted to opiates. No, she really, really had that pain. So we had to liaise with the hematologist. They did the exchange blood transfusion for her. And for this particular woman, since she was in second trimester, uh, mid second trimester, I started her on hydroxyurea as well, so as to stop, you know, the, these um, recurring crises and needing transfusions and, and pain relief. And she did well and delivered safely, and she was she was fine. So it's important to know that there are times when they need exchange blood transfusion. However, if it's taking time to liaise with hematology or you don't have a hematology unit, it's safer to transfuse 
packed HbA a blood cells than to delay while trying to liaise with hematology. Particularly acute chest syndrome, sometimes the only way you can save that patient's life is to quickly go for an EBT. And we had some patients like that, one of whom I will discuss soon. Um, I need to rush through. I don't know how many more minutes do I have, Kendra? I think I've taken quite a bit of time, maybe just three or so. Or so. How many yes, more minutes? Yes, we, we can give you five more minutes. Okay, from. thank you. So um, frequent full blood counts to monitor the white blood cell, like I said, it's key. You should have a chart ideally, so that you can be putting it daily. You can see how the full blood count, the white cell count and all the other things are um, increasing or decreasing when you're monitoring for sepsis or pneumonia. And please don't run away from chest x-rays. You know, sometimes you want to look after pregnant women and you're saying, oh, you don't, you are afraid for the baby, you don't want to do a chest x-ray, please. Is much better and safer to do your chest x-ray. The amount of radiation is really quite low, especially if you do abdominal shielding. Um, procalcitonin helps us differentiate bacterial sepsis for real tertiary healthcare now. Uh, and so um, I'll move on from there. For atypical augmentin, which is one of the more common types of chest infections they have, this combination of augmentin and azithromycin is very good and tends to really help. Quinolones are sometimes necessary and we don't hesitate in giving them when they have a bad chest infection. And it's usually difficult to differentiate between um, pneumonia from acute chest syndrome. So we treat the same way. Give oxygen, give um, the strong antibiotics, and sometimes we need uh, levofloxacin for this, um, and invite your respiratory team and hematology teams early. You need to do your um, SpO2, I can't say it enough. Monitor the respiratory rate. Once it gets into 35, 40, this woman is going to respiratory failure. You, need to, you may need to move her to I, I, ICU so that they can ventilate her more appropriately and also continue the oxygenation. Intrapartum, there is absolutely no contraindication to vaginal delivery in women with sickle cell disease. It's actually, they, are, they do better. And you can also induce them. I know I asked that question. You can induce them. Um, at 38 or 39 weeks, if they've already got there, so as to reduce the risk of them developing a crisis when they've been so well during pregnancy. So after 38 weeks, you can plan them for induction. You can um, group and cross match blood. You should group and cross match blood for delivery. HbA packed cells. Vital signs should be done regularly. Frequent PCV checks. Give them good analgesia during um, labor and delivery. Epidural, if you can. Um, if not, you can use morphine, but please remember to ask about previous opioid use and dependence. It's key to do that these days because that's getting more common. So ask about it. And if the patient says, yes, they, they, would, they have had it, then you should avoid opiates. Um, it's because some people um, have been uh, hooked on opiates, they know and they will admit to you. And you, if you now give them opiates without them knowing, you're making a bad situation worse. However, most of them don't have opioid de dependence. Please don't say, oh, you don't want to give patients pain relief because you think they are addicted. Please don't do that because their pain can be terrible. Adequate fluids, if the hip is unstable or any appropriate obstetric reasons, then you do your cesarean section. After delivery, um, it's important to test, do, um, test for sickle cell disease in the baby, especially if you know that the husband has a trait. Generally, we should be doing universal newborn testing now so that people will know their um, hemoglobin phenotype um, generally when they're born. But anyway, we should do this when we catch the woman postpartum. Maintain optimal oxygenation and hydration for the woman still until she can be weaned off oxygen. Um, Thrombo prophylaxis, regardless of mode of delivery, whether vaginal or cesarean section, you should give a woman with sickle cell disease um, uh, thromboprophylaxis, flexane after she delivered even vaginal because of the tendency, but especially after cesarean section. Close monitoring and vigilance for crises and complications is key. And we had this um, situation where we felt that uh, women with um, uh, within four days after delivery were prone to crisis and possible bone marrow embolism. So we tend to keep them in even after vaginal delivery for four days. Current studies we're doing now may tell us better to know whether we need to keep doing that. Contraceptive advice, very quickly, I'll just mention that progestogens are safe and effective and may decrease the frequency of crises. So your Depo-Provera, your Mirena, Implanon, progesterone only pill are very good for them. Even when they're not um, recently pregnant, they are good for them because they help reduce um, period flow and decrease frequency of crises. Combined pills and IUCD are not 
absolutely contraindicated and may be considered on a case by case basis. Try and encourage them to stop after two children um, and do their BTL um, after that. I won't talk about these experiences because um, I mentioned them a bit during the lecture and time has been far spent. Um, there was a patient who developed acute chest syndrome and sepsis, respiratory rate of 54 cycles per minute, SPOT of 78% on room air, and by God's grace, we still managed to save her life. My team worked very hard on her and we, she had EBT and she was discharged home after 16 days of admission. This was a definite near miss. I won't talk about this lady. What else is new? We are doing some research at the moment in our team. We've done quite a bit of work on sickle cell pregnancy. And we found that um, they, they have certain tendencies to the same tendency that preeclamptics have, that thrombo, thromboxane prostacycline ratio, prostacycline thromboxane ratio is reversed. And you should have more prostacycline and less thromboxane, but they have the other way around, just like women with preeclampsia have. And so we are, um, because aspirin, low dose aspirin is what is being used to prevent that in, in people at high risk for preeclampsia. We are also now, we, we have a, a fund to do a clinical trial, a randomized control trial on women with sickle cell um, pregnancy using low dose aspirin versus placebo. So it's a double blind trial. We've been recruiting since June last year. The recruiting is not fast enough. So if anyone in this um, um, audience is just hearing about this for the first time, please um, get in touch with us about um, uh, sickle cell, any sickle cell patients you have. There are 15 centers and we're recruiting all over Lagos State as well as one center in Ife. Um, of women with sickle cell disease between the gestational ages of 12 and 16 weeks. We're going to increase the, we may need to increase the gestational age soon. We're recruiting them and we're giving them um, low dose aspirin or placebo. It's blinded, so neither ourselves or them know, and it's a randomized control trial. It's the first of its kind in, um, in the world, basically, um, in terms of um, uh, trials with drugs in sickle cell pregnancy. So um, I'll move past here. This is uh, um, the flow chart for the study. Um, women, we're randomizing 476 women in total. And we're allocating some to low dose aspirin and some to placebo. And we're following them up in order to find out whether they can, the aspirin will prevent preeclampsia, whether it will prevent IUGR, prenatal deaths or miscarriages and other complications in pregnant sickle cell women compared with the use of placebo. This results will give us a lot of information about these women, not just to see if aspirin is, is effective, but also to know so much about their parameters, whether they have more miscarriages, whether they need more scans, whether they have pseudotoxemia, so, many, so much information we are going to get from this trial. So I implore you to please um, uh, help us find these women and um, refer to, to, to us. My email address is here and the email address of the, um, of the project manager will also be shared. Um, I thank you very much for listening because I know I've taken quite a bit of time and I'm open to questions um, over to the moderator. Thank you very much. These thank are my you so much. I'm sure nobody recognized that time had gone. Um, it was a really, really great presentation. Lots of learnings. Um, I'm sure we can all agree. You have a lot of questions in the chat in the chat um, room, but I'm going to pause for about five seven minutes for Dr. Akogo from um, Buari General Hospital to present the active um, case of a pregnant woman with sickle cell, just so that all the we would have all the questions and answers and discussions at the same time. Dr. Kogo, welcome to the call. Over to you, please. And to everybody else, please keep your questions coming. Can we please make sure um, Dr. Kogo is um, unmuted? Hello, good afternoon, everybody. Good afternoon, Dr. Kogo. I'm Dr. Abdul Joshua Akogu. I'm presenting the case, a case presentation on sickle cell anemia in pregnancy that was managed in a Buhari General Hospital. This is a case, Mrs. J.S. 
a 33 year old uh, female who's a Yoruba and a Christian. She's a civil servant and is married. She lives in Buari here. She was managed in the general hospital here. Next slide, please. Uh, the, she was admitted on the 15th of uh, December 2020 and, uh, 2020 and was discharged on the 18th of uh, December 2020. Her last menstrual period was on the 24th of uh, June 2020, and her expected date of delivery is on 1st of April 2020. And she presented at uh, 24 weeks, uh, one day. She presented with a complaint of a headache of three days duration, fever of three days duration, and general body pain of two days uh, duration. She was well about until three days prior to presentation when she develops the above symptoms. The headache was said to be troubling and was generalized. The fever was intermittent and was high grade. And she was also having a generalized body pain. And she vomited once. There was no uh, any other uh, symptom. There was no visual impairment. She wasn't coughing and there was no urinary symptom. She had been on uh, paracetamol and folic acid uh, prior to her presentation. The index pregnancy was uh, spontaneously conceived and uh, was desired. However, it was not planned. Pregnancy was uh, diagnosed with a urine ultrasound scan, I mean, urine uh, pregnancy test and was confirmed with an ultrasound scan that was done uh, around uh, 12 weeks of gestation. She had been on folic acid. Uh, however, she discontinued the paludrine, which she was on prior to pregnancy. And she was said to have been stable. She was not very sure, but told us that her uh, stable state part cell volume was at uh, 23%. And the husband was, uh, the husband was a uh, hemoglobin uh, AA. The pregnancy was booked, though because of the uh, way we do our, because of the clinic, the way we, the clinic was uh, run here, she was, she was booked in these facilities. We were not able to see her until when she presented with these symptoms. And she was said to have had uh, three, uh, she was said to have had uh, four uh, uneventful antenatal visits. And she, her last, she was seen three weeks prior to presentation. Next slide, please. please. She was gravid at three para one plus one. Her first pregnancy was six years prior to presentation and she was cons spontaneously conceived. She, however, had a margin lower segment cesarean section at 37 weeks on account of severe preeclampsia and had a live male uh, baby that was alive and well. The second pregnancy was two years ago and she, however, had a, a miss miscarriage at 25 weeks, for which she had a uh, hysterotomy. And she was aware of, uh, uh, she was aware of uh, contraception, and however, she only used a male contraception, male, male condom that which the husband normally used. She's aware of cervical cancer screening, but has not done any. She is a non sickle cell anemic uh, patient that was diagnosed in her first pregnancy in this facility. She has had several blood transfusions, some during the first, uh, first and this, I mean, which were given during the first and the second uh, pregnancy for which she had the uh, surgery. She, she also had a vaso occlusive crisis about one and a half years prior to presentation. In this pregnancy, she has not had any, just like I said earlier. She was, she graduated from tertiary, uh, I mean, a polytechnic, and she is a civil servant who work in the, in the Bwari here. How she also married, she was married, I mean, she is married to a 40 year old uh, civil servant. She does not smoke nor consume alcoholic uh, beverages. On examination, she was a young woman in painful distress. She was febrile to a temperature of 38.2 degrees Celsius. She was pale, she was not jaundiced, there was, she was not dehydrated. The pulse rate was 108 beats per minute, and the blood pressure was 110 over 70 millimeters of mercury. The chest was clear clinically. 
the abdomen was the superficial height was uh, 26 cm. She was it's a singleton fetus, which was longitudinal cephalic presentation, and it was in left hospital anterior position. Fetal heart rate was head and it was regular. We made an assessment of malaria in pregnancy in a sickle cell anemic patient. Next. We ordered for some investigation, the result of which include a past cell volume that was 21%, blood group of zero, I mean, of the, the blood group was uh, uh, O resus uh, uh, positive. The malaria parasites were two pluses. The full blood count was, however, normal. Urinalysis was also normal. The urine MCS that was done yielded no growth after 48 hours. An ultrasound scan done, however, uh, found a single tone features that was that weighed one one thousand gram and put the gestational age at twenty nine weeks with no obvious abnormalities and adequate amniotic fluid and placenta was posterior funda. Patient was admitted and was commenced on intravenous uh, fluid. She had a dextrose saline which was alternated with normal saline. She had intravenous uh, keftriazone. I was also given a, a parenteral uh, parastamol. She was also commenced on anti-malaria. She had a atemetal mafantry BD for three days. She, based on our findings and our finding of her being a pale and a, a PCV of 21% with the pulse, we gave her three, she had a three points of blood of hemoglobin A, AA blood group O raises D uh, positive blood. She was also uh, continued on parastamol, which she had for three days. She was commenced on folic acid, on five milligram uh, folic acid, which she had daily. However, uh, at the end of the day, she was commenced on uh, paludrin, which she went home on it. She was commenced on paludrin, which she went home with it. Next slide, please. Patient got better. The headache and the body pain subsided especially, uh, completely on the second day. And then the fever so the finished, I mean, uh, subsided through on the third day of admission. We had a total uh, post transfusion PCV, which uh, turned out to be uh, 30%. She was discharged and uh, had a two week appointment to the antenatal clinic. She was seen and had been counseled for. Uh, for permanent uh, contraception, which she consented, she had been uh, she had been seen uh, three times since then, and the last visit was a week ago, and she was at 33 weeks gestation. She is being uh, planned for elective surveillance, uh, lower segment surveillance session, and bilateral tubal ligation on account of two previous uterine scar and completed family size, and she is booked for the surgery on 18th of March, 2021. Thank you. Thank you very much. So we're getting to our favorite part of the call where we um, answer questions. Um, Prof, I hope you are ready because we're coming for you in, in large volume. Um, you, you're muted, okay. So please feel, I know I have, a whole lot of questions and we're going to get to them quickly. Um, if you would want to like, ask your question, Reverend, please raise your hand and um, Tunde would, um, on, you know, will call you out in, you know, one by one. But let me read out for the ones that I have. Um, I have a question. How can preconception management be encouraged in our society as it's almost impossible for most households in Nigeria? <laughs> yeah, it's a tough one. It's just um, the usual education because even women who should know better don't come for preconceptual you know, education. So talk less of those who are, um, have a condition. So it's just education, perhaps in the hematology clinics as well, the sickle cell clubs, and uh, yeah, education, communication, generally. And because, because we also run sessions like this 
in lay terms for um, for patients as well, members of the public, um, we would think around a topic around this and um, send to you also that you can send who you think is eligible for those um, discussions. Another question, um, for a sickle cell woman in labor, is it important to place her on intranasal oxygen to improve oxygenation? Yes, it is. I mentioned that during the talk. It's important to give oxygen. Okay. So someone has would like to know why. Yes, no. No, go on, please. Okay. Um, a friend of mine who is um, who is SC got pregnant and gave birth last year. She had an uneventful pregnancy and delivery, no crisis at all during the pregnancy. What do you think helped her? Because sickle cell disease is just a variable condition. So I have had patients who have usually very unpredictable, a very, you know, um, uh, smooth pregnancies and who have no, no major issues sailing and out of hospital. But it's, just, it's not as common. The majority of them will have problems. And the, in the study we did, we found at least 67% of them were admitted at least once. So during the pregnancy. So yes, it's variable and it can happen. Okay. Um, Tunde and Ashrita, please let me know if anybody's raising their hands. Um, I have another question here. I thought SP was the best for malaria prevention in pregnancy, but you mentioned proguanil is better than SP. Can you shed more light on this? Thank you for that question. It's a good one. To be honest, I really do not know that proguanil is better than SP. And we wrote a, a, a proposal for a grant um, recently that wasn't funded, unfortunately. But if you write 10 proposals for a grant, you get one funded. So and it's like writing, it's like trying to get a bank loan. It can be very difficult. But that's one question I really want to answer. I want to know because we, um, it's, it's one of these things that we do without evidence. Traditionally, we have felt that proguanil is, you know, better than um, sulfadoxin pyrimethamine. That is the best, and so we've always given them. Everyone that looks after women with sickle cell disease in this country gives them proguanil to prevent malaria. But we don't know that it's actually better than SP. But we need evidence to change, you know, uh, what we're doing. So what we need to do is to get a trial funded that is. We're comparing um, proguanil to sulfadoxin pyrimethamine. Um, and anybody that knows anyone that can help with um, such um, funding, let us know. I'm going to keep trying anyway to, to still write because I think it's an important question. Because okay. proguanil is so expensive. Hmm. Um, um, so we have someone else asking um, two questions. Is it really necessary? for private facilities to refer patients to tertiary centers? And what is the pain management during labor for sickle cell patients? Thank Those you for questions. that question. It's actually a good question too. So it's not necessary. It's not 100% necessary. If you have the facilities and you have the expertise, then no. But the only thing is that there are a lot of, you know, private facilities are not the same. There are a lot of, you know, private facilities there that the most um, qualified person there is not even necessarily a, a, an obstetrician. Um, it can just be a general practitioner running a, a private um, center. And in such situations, then you do need to refer. And also, if you have a patient that you know, has been um, unwell for a, a number of days, which is what I try to specify, then yes, please refer. Let's, let's be quick to say, OK, we can't handle this case anymore, because the earlier you do that, the better you are helping your, your patient and the more likely you are to save her life. Sorry, the other question was pain relief. Pain epidural management. Is very, very good I know idea. You if you can give yes, epidural. You mentioned. Yeah, mm -hmm. it's, it's good. If not, then um, as long as they don't have opiate addictions, try and get good quality opiates as in morphine. Um, pentazosine is not as good really, but if you don't have anything else, then use pentazosine. You can't use pathogen in sickle cell disease because it's been found, it's been known to give them seizures. So please, you can't use pathogen, but you can use morphine in small doses, not too high, like five milligrams um, is, is appropriate, especially if the woman is not too big. Um, and you can add paracetamol as well to it. 
Um, but epidural is the best if you can find it. Okay, I, we have two hands up and I'll be coming to them in a second. Um, what is the recommended IV flu to use when hydrating sickle cell patients in crisis? Yes, that's another good question. So I noticed that um, some people have been doing 4.3% dextrose, um, you know, I think, I think pediatricians tend to give that. But I was discussing with the hematologist recently and there's no real need, saline basically, normal saline is what you want to give them, you know, to, to rehydrate them, if you want to rehydrate them. If you need to give glucose, you can give, um, after rehydrating, you can give 5% uh, dextrose or so on. But the, the ideal thing is normal saline for rehydration. Okay, um, I'm going to um, ask Saratu Miller to please unmute herself. She was the first hand raised for your question. Please keep it short and to the point. Sarah, if you could unmute yourself. Yes, I am a sickle cell warrior. And um, there are some, I listened when you said um, about using analgesics. Um, during crisis in sickle cell patients, you mentioned um, use of um, morphine. But um, when, while I was much younger, the first time I used morphine, it was really nasty, nasty to my system. So I made sure I avoided anything like that. Anytime I'm being given painkillers, I always ask. It shouldn't be above... Um, What's the other painkiller called? Uh, is it ibuprofen or even Novalgene as a then and all that? But recently, I now chose to depend on supplements, things like um, CBD oil for my pain and whatever use, rather than taking the chemicals, you know, along the hospital medication. And I also use my sickle cell. So I want to find out what do you think about managing sickle cell and them being on supplements, going the natural route now, plant-based supplements. Thank you for that um, question and point. And thank you for joining the lecture and giving your own personal experience. It's, it's, it's always very useful. Um, regarding the um, using uh, supplements, I, I think that um, a lot of the there's some amino acids and thiamine and vitamin B complex um, supplements that have been shown to help, you know, maybe not reduce crisis to a large extent, but at least to a, to a small extent. And it's been found, some of them have been found to be useful. So if supplements, those supplements work for you, then please, by all means, I, I think that they should be, they should be used. Um, we, what we tend to do is to give, um, like in the study trial we're doing at the moment, we're using vitamin B complex as well as folic acid for our pregnant women. And we're trying to see if it's going to make any difference. Now, regarding the pain relief, um, that is why I also mentioned that one should always ask, you know, nobody knows their body more than the, the person. And as a physician, I've, all, I've never been a very prescriptive physician. I, I tend to ask my patient, and if my patient tells me, I don't really think I want this, it doesn't agree with me, I listen to them. I don't say, what are you talking about? Unless it's something that I'm really, I feel will particularly you know, help and they're just saying this thing because they are afraid of medication generally. So I would, I said, let's ask the patient, first of all, have you used any of these opiates? Have you used morphine before? Have you used this before? Make sure that it agrees with them. Make sure that they're not addicted to it. And if so, then use it. Morphine does help a lot of people, a lot of women with sickle cell disease, a lot of sickle cell warriors. Morphine does help a lot of them. But definitely there'll be some people that it disagrees with. And it's important to ask ahead and, and, and avoid it in such, such people. Thank you for the question. Thank you very much. So we have two hands up, but I will take one chatted question before I... We've lost Kendra, is it me? Sometimes when... I call Dr. Um, Someone is... Are you with us? I lost you for a bit. 
Oh yes, we I I, I noticed that. Is there mm -hmm. a different white blood cell count range for HBSS patients in diagnosing sepsis? No, no, really, there isn't. So it's only if it's really high. It's very it's a very difficult mix. Um, so if you have something like um, 18,000, for example, or 20,000, then you know that something definitely is going on. This patient of mine, for example, that is on erythropoietin, her recent white cell count uh, was 16,000, but she's well. Her uh, neutrophils were 60%, her lymphocytes were 30%, her vitals are absolutely stable. She has no complaints whatsoever, so she's well. I checked her urine just to be sure, you know, there's nothing wrong. So it's possible that it can be a particular level without there being a problem. Some other things that could help let you know whether um, there is something going on. Uh, maybe you can do um, C-reactive protein or uh, uh, procalcitonin, like I mentioned, but that procalcitonin helps you determine if it's a bacterial infection going on or um, a viral infection or no infection at all. It helps with that. So it's something that we tend to do um, in the tertiary centers. Okay, I would like to ask um, Dr. Emilsoni, a fellow um, hub expert, to please unmute and briefly ask his question. Dr. Emilsoni, over to you. <coughs> okay, yeah, I'm going to tell myself. No, well, good afternoon. Just to uh, thank Professor Afolabi, great presentation, great work. Um, thank you very much. I, now, <laughs> I, I understand your passion and uh, interest in the, you know, in cichlids and, you know. Okay, now, some three years ago, we, we were alarmed when we looked at the statistic, we looked at the pattern of the contribution of, the contributors to maternal deaths in Lagos State. And we just realized that sickle cell diseases in the whole of Lagos State General Hospitals, as a block, you know, was contributing to a huge number of, you know, um, indirect causes, you know, of uh, maternal death. And uh, so we just made a policy then that most of these cases should be, in fact, they should be managed in tertiary setups or places like Lagos Island Maternity Hospital. The reason being that, uh, yes, you know, they can access guidelines, one, two, they can monitor even more closely. They have sent, they have units that look like that are like high dependency units where you can monitor, administer oxygen, do your SPO2. But, but more importantly, get pathology, get the hematologist to co-manage. And it began to change the picture. And just to concur with you that, um, you know, except you have a setup where you can guarantee substantially uh, some of these things that I've, that I've mentioned is a tough act, very, uh, you know, that shouldn't be encouraged to manage, particularly HBSS patients, you know, in setups where you can't guarantee, you know, some of these basic things. The outcome usually uh, won't be good. So I just, I thought I should again reemphasize that or agree with you and let people know. And that's why, aside from PACs, even general hospitals, where they don't have high dependence or where they cannot guarantee you know, proper monitoring and adherence to some of these basic things. SPO2, oxygen, fluid administration, because of you know, volume of work and all that, they should, we should, they should send to centers or rather we should create centers or small units where for these patients we can manage them properly and do some of these very, very basic things. Access guidelines from you know, centers like yours and other areas where they've done well, just to improve the outcome. And then more importantly, we should have access to hematologists. We used to be very short in numbers, you know, in terms of hematologists in Lagos State Zero. We made case for them and uh, they were brought in and we so arranged them that they were now commanding. And it changed the whole landscape and the outcome. And uh, I'm looking forward to the outcome of this study uh, because even before now, for a number of cases, I put them on, you know, uh, without any evidence, um, low dose aspirin and all, and all of that things. Okay, so just observation and comments. Then secondly, please, don't you think that HBSC patients generally have a milder cause of illness, pre-pregnancy, 
and even during pregnancy, because somebody made an observation that SC patients, I think we lost uh, relatively on the course. I have, uh, you know, without doing my, you know, our city and all that, also observed all of that, you know. So I don't know your take on, you know, how HBSC patients and HBSS patients. Not that was that could be courageous enough to take on HBSC patients, hemoglobin SC patients in pregnancy. HBSS, I would rather want to push them or encourage to push them to centers where they can do a lot more, tertiary center. Your thoughts, please, on HBSC patients and HBSS in terms of their behavior, outcomes and all that in pregnancy, especially. I know your experience, please. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Masami. Thanks a lot. Um, um, I respect Dr. Masami a lot for his hard work in Lagos and he's a very, very um, close colleague. Um, your words, most of everything you said, I totally agree with. Um, I just wanted to point out at the beginning of the lecture, I mentioned that we don't use the term sicklers anymore. <laughs> we say hemoglobin SS, so please, or sickle cell disorder or sickle cell disease, but not sicklers. Um, regarding HBSC patients, yes, definitely the cost seems to be uh, more, um, less, you know, oftentimes they're, they're, they're not often as unwell, they do better. However, they're also a bit unpredictable. And sometimes they are the ones that have the acute chest syndromes or they are the ones that have the strokes sometimes. So it's, it's important to still keep an eye on them carefully. They tend to have a higher hemoglobin like PCV. They can have 28%, they can have 30%, but it's still they can still be unpredictable at times. Overall, generally they do better, that's for sure. And our study will be able to at least see that as well because we're looking at both groups and we're going to analyze them separately um, at the end of the day so that we can we can make a definition thank you so um thank you um prof because i know you've been in, busy in the chat box um answering questions there are lots of questions around pain um epidural um NSAIDs, um and coco demo if you want to just quickly wrap up that um, discussion, your answers um, to those questions. Would you just want to share some thoughts about the use of um, NSAIDs and epidural? Um, yes, regarding the NSAIDs, I think I mentioned that um, we don't, even in general pregnancy now, we know that NSAIDs are now contraindicated, especially in early pregnancy. So we stopped using NSAIDs in the first trimester. And then we've always known that in the last few weeks, it's not a good idea either because of the um, premature closure of the doctor's arteriosus. However, um, for pain, it's still very useful. And for people that have, um, for sickle cell patients that are between like 12 and 28 weeks or so, we definitely use, in fact, we still use up to 32 weeks sometimes for the severe pain, if they're in a lot of pain, we can use it as an additional um, tool. In fact, it's one of the things that is very good for their pain relief. Then when it comes to um, general pregnancy too, we don't tend to use it, but we use it for people that have things like fibroid degeneration because it can be very painful. So, yes. That's okay, we're wrapping up the... No, we're wrapping up the question section. Please don't go away without the pretest and without the post quiz. Um, someone is, ask, is asking, how long should these women be on thromboprophylaxis following a vaginal delivery or a CS? I'm sorry, say that again. How long should the women be on thromboprophylaxis following yeah. a vaginal delivery or a CS? For vaginal delivery, once they're ready to leave hospital, we stop. Same thing for CS, but what we just do for the CS is that we tend to tell them to still keep wearing their TED stockings when they go home. So once they start mobilizing and they, they're leaving hospital, especially for the CS, we, we, we wait for them to be ready to leave hospital before we stop. Okay, this is a quick answer. Someone's asking for the dose of proguanil to give, um, 100 milligram or 200 milligram daily. Sorry, we use 200 milligrams daily. 200 now is the dose for proguanil. 
Okay, thank you very much. And someone's asking about what, you know, there are a couple of questions around what PCB by the, um, you transfuse, but you had already explained that it depends on, you know, the um, free state of the woman um, to determine when you give blood transfusion. Um, I think I have, just looking through to make sure I haven't. So um, one of our doctors is saying, I have a patient at 24 weeks GA who is on hydroxychloroquine for her rheumatoid arthritis. Okay, you need that. I still give, yeah, we still give SP. We still give sulfadoxin and pyrimethamine because um, the dose of hydroxychloroquine being used is not really a prophylactic um, dose. So we still give okay. SP at least twice. Okay. Thank you very much, Prof. I think we've covered the questions. We're just going to quickly launch the post quiz. If you didn't have an opportunity to do it at the beginning, please do it before you, you drop off. Let's see how, how correct we are. Just six questions, simply yes or no. Pick which one you think is the answer. It should be popping up on your screen right now, either on your phone or your laptop. We'll just quickly do this in two two minutes and share our appreciation and our thanks to Prof and we can get on with our evening. Okay, so waiting on our six questions. And as we answer the question, I want to thank our team of hub experts. I see Dr. T.D. Oye on the call, I see Dr. Orode Dorothy, I see Dr. Moa Falashe, Dr. Moseni, thank you so much for making the call. Um, a couple of people turning in their um, answers. Thank you to our partners. Um, thank you to the MDOC team and to our partners, Jupaigo and HSDF for being on to call. And to every healthcare professional that was concerned about their patients enough to be on this call. I think it says a lot about um, you wanting to give the best quality of care. I see a lot of facilities on the call. Thank you to every, every person. We will be sending this within the net by tomorrow, end of tomorrow. You should have a link to the video and audio of this um, session, as well as the PDF version of the slides. Please don't sneak away before um, we leave. So Dr. Orode has a last question to ask, and this is to Dr. Okogo. And she's saying she wonders why the patients we presented from General Hospital Buari with a PCV of 21% had three pints of blood. Dr. Kogu, if you're still on the call, if you could unmute and answer that. 56% of people have submitted the polls. Uh, we'll be closing it very soon. One minute more. Please don't, don't miss Dr. Um, Prof giving us the answers to these questions. Just hang on. We'll be wrapping up in three, four, five minutes. Is Dr. Kogu still on the call? If he is, he'll take the question. 62% of people have submitted. Um, I know that Ralph, um, my apologies, Ralph. I know you had your hand up. I hope your question has been answered. Oh, I see Asma Rufai. Um, Prof, can we sneak in one more question? I hate to leave a hand hanging. Asma Rufai, can you quickly unmute and ask your question? If, you, if it's been, if it's not been answered. Hello, everyone. Hello. Um, please, I want to ask um, if someone on hydroxyria can get pregnant and can the person still be taking hydroxyria? Yes, um, someone on hydroxyurea, well, when we, we, we try to tell them to stop if we know they are going to get pregnant. But if they were already on it before they got pregnant, then um, we just tell them to stop it because uh, I will continue the pregnancy. So we, it's, it's contraindicated in pregnancy, but because it is such a, um, it's been shown that most women that have it do not um, do not have 
abnormal um, babies, or it does not cause congenital abnormalities in most women that have it. Um, it's, it's, um, we don't discourage, we don't tell the woman, oh, you, you would have to have a termination or, oh, there's a major problem. We just advise them to carry on with the pregnancy. At least so far, we haven't found it to be. I just wanted to say something quickly to the poll. Um, I think, I, I don't think I addressed this prophylactic blood transfusion point, which is why there's still so much of a difference. Basically, we don't give prophylactic blood transfusions. Um, a randomized control trial and a systematic review on that topic has shown that um, it's better to transfuse only when necessary. Because even though prophylactic blood transfusion was found to reduce the number of crises to an extent, it did not do anything to maternal mortality or perinatal mortality. And because of that, you know, if, you're, if you keep giving blood, the risks of blood transfusion include alloimmunization, as in they, they tend to get um, react to blood easily. The patient I'm talking about that I, I mentioned just now that is on erythropoietin, she can't have blood. She's always reacting to blood. So that's part of why they put her on that. So it's important to note that you don't give prophylactic blood transfusion. You only give um, transfusion when it is necessary. You try not to give too much as well. Okay, so if we could just go through the six questions carefully, I'll just read them out. And if, are vasoclusive crises common in sickle cell pregnant women? Yes, yes or no? Are very so 98% of people got that. Just two people answered um, false. Is prophylactic blood, um, blood transfusion preferable to selective transfusion in sickle cell pregnancy? You said the answer is false. So most That's people got that. 72% of people got that. Um, can pregnant women with sickle cell have induction of labor? 90% yes. of people got that correct. Is thromboprophylaxis advised after normal vaginal delivery in sickle cell pregnant women? Um, yes, it is. 92% of people got that. Is overhydration a trigger for vasoclusive crisis in sickle cell pregnancy? No, it is not. It is a no, trigger for pulmonary edema, but not for vasoclusive crisis. Okay, so everyone here is a trigger for- Dehydration is one we don't want. We don't want, this dehydration that is a trigger for vasoclusive crisis. Okay, 63% of people got that. Is the cell count often low in sickle cell pregnancy? No, it's not. 83%. So the great thing is that we had the higher, very, a much higher margin for the correct answers than the wrong answers. Thank you, everyone. Please um, remember to drop your topics that you were creating our curriculum for the year. So remember to drop your topics of interest and um, we would make sure to incorporate it. Can everyone please just unmute and say a warm thank you and some clapping for Professor Afolabi. Thank you very much. <laughs> Thank you, Prof. We're super, super grateful for your time um, and, and your effort in you know, sharing your wealth of experience. Thank you very, Thank very you. much. I would call Dr. Orode to say thank you for all the participants. Dr. Orode, are you still here? I'm here. Okay. And yeah, on behalf of the participants in the room, I would like to say a big thank you to Professor Falabi. Thank you. This has just been invaluable and you're always on point. And thank you to MDoc and to Kendra for being such a great host. And thank you to the entire team. And we're raring to go. What's a huge number at the start of the year. Aren't you all excited? This is going to be an exciting year. So thank you, everyone. Thank you. Thank you, Mark. Thank you, Ma. Thank you very much, Ma. Thank you, Ma. Bye bye. Thank you, Ma. 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 Thank you, Thank you, Thank you, everyone. Bye. Thank you. 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 Thank you.
Thank you, Prof. Thank you, Prof. Thank you, Prof. Thank you, Prof. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thank you very much, Thank you, Prof.